guess I'll formally welcome everyone to the Scaling Research That Rocks, or at least it isn't rubbish, presented by Kate Towsey. Um, over to you, Kate. Thank you. Scale. It's the business word of the decade. It feels like everybody's talking about scale. We talk about scaling things. We talk about things being scalable. We talk about the scalability of things, and we talk about things being delivered to scale. We talk about things that are delivered at scale or are working at scale. But what does it all mean? You can scale a fish, which has scales. You can measure yourself on a scale, which works on a scale of measurement like pounds or kilos, depending on where you are in the world. But we're talking about scale in the business sense. So if you look at the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, they say that scale is a distinctive relative size, extent, or degree. So projects done on a large scale. Here's a home that's built on a small scale relative to its neighbors. But also there's two scale according to the proportions of an established scale of measurements. So floor plans drawn to scale. They need to be accurate to a certain scale of measurement, like feet and inches in the imperial system, or if you're metric, meters and centimeters and millimeters and so on. And here's scaled and scaling. And now we get closer to the kind of scaling that we're talking about to make, regulate, or estimate according to some rate or standard, like this is often used with back, down, or up. So to scale down imports, or why not to scale up research? This is most often planted, uh, plotted on some amazing looking uh, brain bending graph like this, and it plots scale against certain measures. So in this case, on the y-axis, elapsed time in years, and on the x-axis, population in millions. So you might be thinking, well, that's all very well, Kate, but what does it all mean? Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, again, they wrote an article called What Does Scale the Business Mean? Because they were asking the same question. And they said that scale is increasingly being used as shorthand for scale up to grow or expand in a proportional and usually profitable way. And as a noun, that means proportional growth, especially of production or profit. So there's one word that is repeated in here, and it's proportional which means having the same or a constant ratio. You might remember the word standard and ratio and standards of measure. They're these words that have come through in all these definitions, it's outside of fish and standing on scales. But even then the standard is pounds and kilos. So you might build a thing that looks after the needs of researchers. I'm giving this a vague box and then you scale it to another 10 researchers. And then you multiply it to another 10 and another 10 and another 10 until you are looking after 50 researchers. You have scaled research, and then you go to 100, 150, 200, 250. I always wanted to do auctioneering, 300 and 350. It's amazing, you've scaled research. There's not a lot that's absolutely constant or in ratio or purely proportional in research. Let me explain. As many of you will know as researchers, research is not cookie cutter work. It isn't in any way similar to making millions of chocolate bars or hundreds and thousands of the same motor cars. Research, every single study that you do is unique. They're inconsistent. It's variable. In fact, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that there's no such thing as scaling research. What? Like I've written a book as Ned mentioned called Research That Scales coming out second half of this year. And this talk is called Scaling Research That Rocks. So what am I talking about? What do I mean? Well, research is less like this, less of the cookie cutter manufacturing line and more like this, an assortment of confectionaries. It runs on variety. Let me explain. As you as researchers would know, there are lots of different types of methods of research. You get interviews, usability testing, ethnographic research, longitudinal studies. I don't have unmoderated research in here, but I could easily have that and several diary studies, many more I could put in here. And quantitative researchers, not to um, insult the quant researchers in the, in the room. I know that you can break up quant research into lots of spokes of different kinds of uh, methods too. And each of these methods needs different types of operations, different types of participants, different types of tools different types of consent forms, different types of approaches across the entire piece. And then you get different types of people. And here we have people who do research, 
PWDR, the very name of this conference, thanks Ned. As you said, it's a term I came up with sometime in 2019 to talk about this really important cohort of research ops customers. People who do research are researchers, of course, primary, primary customers, but we also have product managers, designers, and anyone else who needs to do research to understand their customers better so that they can do their job well. But I promised earlier that I was introducing a new term and there is another equally important cohort of people that research ops must, though doesn't often enough, think about. And that is PWNR, people who need research. This is um, like product managers. Product managers need to understand what their customers want to make great product decisions. They need to know what do my customers love? What's making them churn or leave the product? What's gonna delight them even to keep them paying us money or sticking around? You have executives who need research ideally to work at that meta level of management to understand what to accelerate and what to decelerate at various times to be able to keep their ship on track, to going in the right direction. And then we have designers who obviously need to know that their designs are working well. How do I adjust things? What is not working for the people who use the system or use this, this user interface? So they need research to be able to do that. And there are PWDRs, people who do research. Ideally, PWDRs um, are building new knowledge on old. So they're not starting from scratch all the time. So this cohort of people they don't necessarily do research, but they need research, they consume research. These people, they need different things to succeed as well. They don't all need the same things. People who do research, they need operations to find out. And this involves from an operations point of view, making sure they've got access to participants. They've got access to the right tools and vendors that they need to do research. They've got training, particularly for um, the democratized world of research where you've got uh, product managers and designers and people who aren't necessarily professional researchers coming in and needing to for a variety of reasons, again, that word variety, to do the work of a researcher. They need support, lots of support to be able to, be able to access these tools, to use them. There's a, a long list of tools that someone might need, long lists and varieties of types of participants they might need to recruit and they need a lot of support to be able to understand and navigate that. There's a lot of ethics and privacy I don't need to mention here to be able to collect people's information to keep people, um, uh, you know, do no harm within the research process. So there's guidance and protocols to deliver there. And last but not least, there's the need for a lot of money. There is an enormous amount of the management of the flow of money to keep participant platforms paid for, to keep tools paid for, to keep transcriptions, tools funded, and so on and so forth. So people who need research they need operations to understand. It's a different type of operations that they need. They need access to a person who does research. So this could be an in-house person, a designer, a researcher, anyone else, or it could be an agency. Ideally, they're watching research that it's already going on within the organization and they're doing this via observations or via labs. They're ideally consuming research that's already happening, and this is in reports and videos. Hopefully they're engaging, <laughs> speaking to researchers. They're not just expecting a researcher to dump a report on their desk, and then they're like, great, that's amazing. I think I understand, or they simply never read it. And this is via meetings and presentations and even chatting around the water cooler. And then ideally, and everybody's dream, something that we're actually going to be achieving pretty soon, they can find the research that already exists in the organization. And that could be via library. Again, something that we're launching end of March, which is super exciting for us at Atlassian, but also by networking, by being able to connect with people who know the people who find out or people who have access to the knowledge that they need. So research operations is a combination of two things. It's a combination of giving people ways to find out and giving people ways to understand. Now you can't talk about PWDR without talking about this conference, but also without talking about democratized research, another very popular term, certainly in this profession of this decade. And this brings up a final variable that we'll look at today because the list of variables could go on, but this one's interesting and important. It's different levels of rigor. You could have a PM, and I don't mean to pick on the PMs in the room, 
we might chat to a customer once a week. It's just a casual chat with a coffee. And yet for them, that's research. That's what they call research. That might make a researcher's hair stand on end, but in their world, that's research. Or sometimes not, really depends on the PM. You might have a designer who recruits a cohort of participants. They have a study plan, um, but they're perhaps not as diligent on analysis and synthesis. They feel like they've heard what happened in the session and they've got the main points and they move on into fixing their design. They're doing a form of research at a different level of rigor. And then you get a researcher or a diligent designer or a diligent pro product manager or developer, whoever it is, who really goes the full mile and they do a great level of rigor with applied research as many of the researchers in the room will do on, in, in, in your day-to-day -day job. And then finally, there's academic levels of research rigor that may go even through an independent review board. Um, it's, it's so rigorous. So the point is, and in summary, variation rules in research and research operations. We have different methods, we have different people with different needs to look after and different levels of rigor that are needed or are required purely from um, a point of view of getting things done to look after those needs. We also have different products and different speeds. Uh, at Atlassian, we've got 18 plus products. I lose track as we acquire new ones, but also different teams are moving at different speeds, different projects are needed at different speeds. Um, and so there's different need for operations there too, different needs for support. So if you need varied uh, vari variation rules, you have to have varied operations, which brings me back to the point that research is less this, less of the cookie cutter, less of the factory line, less of like a million vanilla raspberry topped cookies, and much more this assortment of confectionaries. Well, that's easy enough. Why not just scale an assortment of confectionaries? Well, an assortment is hard to scale. It's not impossible because otherwise you wouldn't get these boxes of assortment of confectionaries. But if you're a small team of say one research ops professional, which is often the case, or in our case, I manage a team of 10 research, research ops professionals, even then you'll need a lot more resourcing to deliver this kind of assortment at a high quality to everyone to deliver great research or to deliver research that rocks. And so, you know, I'm looking at this and going, yeah, kind of assortment, finger in the air calculation based on much past experience. You'll need a team of 20 or more people in your ops team, depending on the number of people that you're looking after. So we have here on the y-axis, the number of people who do research and the number of people who need research. But the one that is uh, more concerning to me is the x-axis, the sanity of research operations. There is simply not enough time to get all of these variables done. You might be thinking, well, Kate, this sounds quite depressing. All you've come with this morning is moaning and groaning and telling us where things can't be done. We are going to swing that ship around. Let's go back to the basics. Research operations is ways to find out and it is ways to understand. People who do research, they need ways to find out. And that's in, in terms of operations land, we give them participants or we don't give them, we provide them with ways to find participants. We give them tools and vendors. We offer training, we offer support. We make sure they've got good ethics and privacy guidance in place. We make that to make sure that the money is flowing smoothly throughout so they don't have any hitch hitches that money has run out. We look after people who need research and they need ways to understand. They need access to people who do research to do the research for them. Hopefully they're watching. We need to design pathways that allow them to observe research. Um, hopefully they're consuming research that's going on and it's easy to consume. They can um, bring it into their mind and they can absorb it and, and then do something about it. They can engage and be part like team effort with their researchers and they can find research that already exists. The eagle eyed of you in the space will be looking at this and going, well, isn't this knowledge management? And you'd be right. So between ways to find out and ways to understand, we can bring these worlds together into a cohesive model. One could even call it an operating model, a way to operate. And I'm going to introduce to you with a drum roll, the insights flywheel. 
This is what the insights fly will look like. This is something that we currently are exploring in our work at Atlassian is currently questioning. This is not a finished piece of work. As I said, I manage a team of 10 research ops professionals and we're looking after 500 people who do research at Atlassian. So we know a thing about scale and we know a thing about ratios and we also know a thing about where ratios fall down. Looking at this model on the inner circle, um, not right at the center where you've got insights, but the next circle out, the ring, um, we've got different ways of learning, original research, we've got searching existing insights, we've got entity building, possibly low rigor, but ways of building empathy with customers or your end users. Um, and then we've got DIY research, helping people to do research on their own. On the outer ring, we've got things that we as operations can do to support people in engaging with those various ways of learning. So it goes somewhat to that notion of a learning organization, which is really what research is all about. I'm going to break this down for you a bit. So we have original research first, where you can get access to a full-time research, and we uh, are setting up pathways to make that really easy. Or you could hire a research contractor, and this is via a, a pre-approved vendor list. The next quadrant down is about existing insights. I mentioned that we're launching a very, very cool, serious research library on the 31st of March, which we're very excited about. Um, so you could search through that. And we can also use that tool to send new research alerts to people who have signed up to particular topics, which is pretty awesome. It's like a push-pull mechanism. We're going to push you to the library um, or pull you to the library rather than we're going to push um, alerts towards you about research that you should know about. We've got empathy building. Our product managers want to spend time with customers. It's not necessarily about rigorous research or insights that they might be getting from researchers or designers, whoever's doing their research for them, but it's about immersing and spending time with customers. And we're working on delivering week weekly customer um, immersions, touch points with customers, but also uh, again, on, on getting people to observe sessions on creating an easy pathway that allows that. And finally, there's DIY research, which is really where as a team we started and where many democratized research efforts in terms of research operations start is, is all into the DIY research. And here we have a really sharp set of tools, minimalist, but sharp set of tools. And we've got craft coaching, we've got a lot of training and support and everything else that goes around all these things, a lot of admin to make this wheel spin. These parts of the, of the wheel, um, they each have a different primary customer. Uh, original research is ultimately for people who need research. They'll come and connect and say, I need some research about this thing. And then we need to involve a person who does research to be able to deliver that for them. Um, the next part is um, existing insights. And here again, it's, it's both people who need and people who do research. You can use this information to enrich what they are already doing. Then we have people who need research, our primary, primary customers for the empathy building. They, they're not necessarily, it's wanting to immerse with customers and get to know them. And then finally, the primary customer for DIY is people who do research. How can we give them operations to enable them to do great research or research that at least isn't rubbish um, in ways that are really efficient and are fast enough for them or slow enough for them, depending on their need? So the top half of this uh, uh, um, flywheel is ways to find out, pretty much ways to find out new things ideally, new things that the organization doesn't yet know. And the bottom half of the quadrant is ways to understand, um, ways to understand what we already know. And these two things, they, they need to communicate with each other. People who need to understand things, they need people to find out for them. And people who need to find out things, they need to know what people want to understand to even know where to go and what to find out. So I'm hoping that you think this looks very smart hoping that you think, wow, maybe this is a pretty cool model. Maybe I can take the insights flywheel back to my office tomorrow or your home office, and I can make this happen in my organization and I can deliver research that's scalable research that rocks. Well, it does have a few problems. Even within it, I could start picking it apart and finding ways to improve it. But the biggest problem with it is you've got to remember that variation rules. We go back to the idea that research isn't mass production of the same things over and over again. It isn't a factory line. It is an assortment of cookies. It's an assortment of operational needs. It's an assortment of legitimate requirements. I'm going to introduce you to the idea of a standard issue research ops cookie. It's a vanilla cookie. 
Now, vanilla cookies aren't bad. In fact, they're an excellent baseline for lots of other flavors. I was looking online for a picture of a cookie bar where possibly you can sprinkle different types of icing on top, different types of ingredients on top, but I couldn't find one. Someone should open that business and take a picture. The thing with vanilla cookie is they're not the most personal, exciting type of cookie. If you have a particular need, like a vegan or gluten-free, well then, good luck. You're just not going to be catered to. And research is a bit like that too. Here's how. You have a standard issue cookie and you deliver standard participants, a standard consent form. We've done this at Atlassian and it's worked pretty well for around about three years until we started to need a consent form for internal research, a consent form for accessibility research, a consent form for different types of things. Standard training. You're not going to teach necessarily specific methodologies like longitudinal research, but just how do you do good interviews, basic stuff for people who do research. A standard and pretty minimalist set of tools, like standard issue tools that you might pick up as you uh, onboard into the organization, and then we add to that so that it's highly um, efficient, etc. You could go on with this list with all the sort of various standardized things, standardized templates, for instance, that you could deliver. Now, if you're starving, a vanilla cookie is better than nothing. It might not meet your need perfectly, but it is, it's standard. It's better than nothing. The thing is that standard issue is also highly scalable. As a team of 10, we've scaled standard issue, as I mentioned earlier, to 500 Atlassians, and, and it works OK. It's, it's a good starting point. No one's ever going to starve, as I mentioned, and it's, it's good. No one ever got an award for OK. No one's ever thrilled with OK. It's just like, yeah, that's nice. It's a vanilla cookie. It only works great when people are not too picky about their needs. And there are many inst instances in a large organization of people who do research. I call them AWDRs, Atlassians who do research. It works pretty well. But when you work in a big organization, people also have lots of specialist skills. And we've got a team of 130 or 150, somewhere between that at this point, researchers. And they're highly skilled researchers. They have a necessitated need for variety to be able to do their job well. So let's mix these two um, ideas. You have a vanilla cookie flywheel, the standard issue flywheel. And as I said, if you don't have particular needs, that's fine. But there are a lot of particular needs in research, particularly in the research team, but from product managers as well. And if you ignore these needs and you just go, nope, we're going with scalable. Scalable is exactly where we're going. Don't tell me what you need. We're going for scalable. Not a bad thing to do. But if you ignore these needs completely over time, the cookie can crumble. Let's dig into that a little bit more. So our standard issue flywheel, you go into original research. Well, there are different questions, lots of different research questions, different relationships that are driving um, the relationships between researchers, people who do research, PMs, the people asking the questions, different types of people who do research with different skills, different backgrounds. There are different requirements for information from the library. Some people really need internal research. They need a particular type of internal research. Other people are needing to access particular topics um, from in, uh, external research. That's what they, they're really looking for, um, access to big industry papers and things like that. But also the librarian's got to man manage the influx of a variety of different topics and keep the taxonomy right so that people can actually find things. So there's a lot of variety there. When it comes to the empathy building, it's lower on the level of rigor usually, it doesn't have to be. But here you need a lot of different types of research participants, again, for lots of different people needing different things and that can put pressure on your scale. And then in DIY research, there's all sorts of things, the kinds of tools people need, the kinds of participants they need is hugely variable. As I mentioned earlier, the kinds of informed consent that people need um, is uh, that can grow too. We're, we're now looking at building out an informed consent library with uh, five or so different types of consent forms. And then last but not least, thank you gifts, even those, depending on who your audience is, who your participants are, will need different treatment. So standard issue, it can leave many people with big gaps for some kind of more specific and important is the important word, important research that's going on in the organization, really important research because it's often the important research. It's just that little bit special, has a particular angle to it. And so you have people who need to do enterprise research or they need Smarties on their cookie. Enterprise research for those of you who don't work in a B2B setting um, is um, big, big companies, big clients like Microsoft, like IBM, like Google, 
um, those sort of really heavy hitting clients, which have got a real complexity around participants and operations and consent forms and uh, all those kinds of things, even relationships within the organization. Then you might have chocolate chip cookie, which is specific to churn research. Churn is um, when customers drop off from using your product, they just unsubscribe and leave you. Now they're really interesting because it's particularly hard to get hold of churn customers. I'm leaning on some participant recruitment examples here. Um, they, they're tricky. They've left the organization. They're ideally not left a footprint as to where they are. And you've got to be careful how you reach out to them. And then last but not least, I mean, this list could go, you could have a million different types of cookies as we've seen in the pictures. There's accessibility research, um, which has got very, very specific needs in terms of privacy and ethics. And again, recruitment and so on and so forth. Informed consent, every part of operations needs to respond to the fact that you are doing research with people who are living with a disability. So again, what should I do? Let's get some solutions here. It shouldn't be all doom and gloom. Well, the first thing to know is that a baseline of operations, the baseline cookie, the vanilla cookie is not a rubbish place to start. It's actually a great place to start. You can build things on a vanilla cookie. You can add things into the recipe. You can add chocolate chips. You can add Smarties. It's a really, really good place baseline to start. And were I to start all over again, I would start with a vanilla cookie all over again. And again, it's highly scalable. But what you've got to remember is that a vanilla cookie won't satisfy everyone. I think one of the mistakes we made was going, here's the vanilla cookie. Oh, quite a few people aren't happy with vanilla cookie. They're asking for other things. Gosh, okay, so this we're now at this point of trying to figure out how do we take this baseline, and we are able to do it, take this baseline of tools and structures and handbooks and training and administration that we've got and turn it towards very specific needs. So the vanilla cookie is a great place to start, but it won't look after everyone. You can have a lesser degree of enterprise research, particular types of things that might, you might scale less of. They might be too complicated to scale. Uh, it might take you more time to keep them running, but you make sure that, that, that these very specific high priority areas get looked after over time. What you can do is you can, once you have your baseline up, it's, it's find lots of ways to deliver efficiencies and make your standard issue as efficient and as discreet and as minimal as possible so that you buy yourself space to start looking at these alternative and really important needs. Again, the same with churn research, find a way to bring those needs in, the particular operations that you need for it. And then again, with accessibility research, depending on your priorities and your resources. So I've used some examples here in terms of enterprise churn and accessibility, but it's for you to look across your organization, even with the vanilla cookie and go, what is it that my organization needs at the very, very baseline? What is the minimal set of standard issue kit um, that they need to be able to get off the ground and not be hungry? And then later on to think, where can I really impact and take that and build on it to develop research that's great. So if you don't think about all of this diversity up front, the cookie will crumble on you. Um, it, you'll still have something there, but it's not gonna be um, a great show for anyone really. Um, so here's an image to remember, keep it in mind. Vanilla is not rubbish, it's just not special, but it's fine, it feeds a lot of people. Make sure to look at your priorities, look at the things, the places that you can implement something that is really great, those high priority areas and carve that capacity out. In wrapping, scaling research that rocks, set a baseline with standard issue research ops. Figure out your most important specializations like accessibility. That's a very, very good one to start out with. And then work on what you've already got and figure out what you can specialize to meet those needs. I hope you've enjoyed this bit of a bizarre journey on the and you're probably all hungry by now. I think it's, it's coming up for just post lunchtime for you. So you'll be rushing out to go and get an assortment of cookies. Thank you so much.